When I was younger, I never, I never thought about getting older. I couldn't imagine. There used to not be enough place on the dance card for all the men that wanted to dance with me. Now, nobody invites me to the party. You know, in this community, you, you really don't talk about uh, getting older. You're an old lady first. And whoever thinks of an old lady being a lesbian? It is a shock to find out you're old, being gay, and nobody wants to be with you. The elder gay issue is the one that affects every single one of us because every one of us is, is getting older. Who is in more dire straits at a senior level than a gay or lesbian who has no partner and has no children? Not everybody will rent to someone they suspect is a lesbian or is a gay man. The house I live in is really old and, uh, you know, it's falling apart and I can't afford to fix it. And uh, so I'd like to be in a new place. There is almost no affordable housing uh, available in Los Angeles County. Not only is there not affordable housing, but many of the seniors, as we know, in that income category um, have been forced to go back into the closet. I'm making the best that I can with this box that I live in, but I also have a dream to, to live in another place. That's why senior housing is so important to me. Uh, my name is Arthur Aguirre. I am 42 years old and I live in Echo Park. Okay, except that you're 64, so... What did I say? 42. Did I say 42? <laughs> Boy, did I lie. Hello? I am 64 years old, going on 12. This is the way I am. I love being a kid. Now, I designed my first float for the Rose Parade in 1959. And some people in the business liked my work. They said, would you like to design floats for, for a living? I said, you're going to pay me to do this? I would do this for free and I haven't stopped since. I love this job. I'll work forever. Oh my, I'll never stop doing this. When I can't move this hand anymore, then I'll stop. When I was a boy, well, I was about five years old, I knew something was different. I knew that I didn't, I didn't want to go outside and play with the guys or the kids. I wanted to stay inside and draw. I, I drew fashion and buildings, okay? That's what I love doing. But my dad kept telling me, you gotta be outside with the guys. So there was always this negative feeling about myself from him that I wasn't good enough because I've always wanted to be an, a designer, an artist. My father said, you have to work like I work. Get your hands dirty. I said, Dad, I want to be an artist. And he said, no, you got to work like me, like a man. And so there was a conflict again of what I really wanted to do. So I, I doubted that all of my life. I could never even say that I was an artist till I was like in my 50s. I really believed my dad. Now I know that he was wrong. Well, I met the love of my life in 1985, and that's when I, that's the first time I've ever fallen in love. And that's when I decided that I was gonna live with him for the rest of my life. I'm gonna get sad. It still hurts, because I want him here right now. I miss him so much. He died in 1989, and my, my life fell apart. I wanted to die myself. I did everything I could to die. Didn't work. Uh, once I found out that I was going to live, I had to find out how to live. People that living with HIV at my age uh, deserve to have a life to have dreams, uh, I do. That's where I am now. I live in a state of poverty and the housing situation I'm in, the woman wants me to leave and there's just, just nothing available. Yes, I can go live in somebody's apartment for $500 a month that I don't know, and will they take me as a lesbian? I don't know. Uh, I've moved over 50 times in my life. I'd like something permanent. That's what I'd like, you know? I'm, I'm so tired of moving. 
I was born in Akron, Ohio, raised in Akron, Ohio, in the same house uh, for 18 years. When I was in high school, they didn't think I was a very good student. So they didn't allow me to take college uh, classes. They had me take homemaking classes. And so I was groomed to get married, and that was in the 50s. I didn't agree with what they were saying and doing, but I did marry early. I married at, at age 20. I had strong feelings for women when I was about um, 16. In my marriage, what would happen, I would um, really have be attracted to friends that we ran around with and uh, get drunk with the women and uh, you know, want to make passes at them, but, you know, I didn't. We started seeing family counseling. She was into saying, well, you hate your father, and that's why you are a latent homosexual. So what I did with this whole therapy stuff was I had never worked. I went to work. I got myself together to get out of the relationship with him, and then I took my sons and I left. My husband came after my kids in 1976 because he knew I was a lesbian. And um, I kidnapped him and took him to Hawaii. And uh, I got caught. And unfortunately, rather than put me in prison, they put me in a mental institution when they brought me back. And my kids were gone. And I didn't have contact with them for two years. It was, it, I cried every day, every day and we still all suffer from it. When did I notice I was beginning to get older? I think about 1995, because I was in a serious automobile accident. Okay. And I think I probably wouldn't still be aware that I was getting older if I hadn't been seriously injured. Wait for me. Oh, you know, that. slow pop on. What frustrates me the most is that I have a wonderful nine-year-old granddaughter and I can't play basketball with her, and I can't run with her. God, it's a gorgeous day, isn't it? Yeah. I only had one mantra when I was growing up, while all the other kids were saying, I'm going to grow up and be a, a fireman or, or a policeman. People would ask me, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I'd say, when I grow up, I'm going to Hollywood, and I'm going to learn how to live. This is uh, Donna Michi and me in a show called The Girl in the Freudian Slip, and I'm happy to say that my curtain call got larger applause and he didn't care for it too much. Oh, and that's a picture of my friend Carrie Fisher and her mother, Debbie Reynolds. Carrie's my best friend in the whole world. She's wonderful. She's very supportive of our community. I grew up in Baton Rouge and in a small town right across the river from uh, Baton Rouge called Port Allen, Louisiana, and more specifically, a dirt road called Sunrise, Louisiana. My father was a state policeman and uh, involved in music and basketball. I had great parents. I had wonderful parents. When I was about nine years old, I went to see The Yearling, and it was the first time I discovered that there were child movie stars and I went home and demanded that my family give up everything and move to Hollywood. And they refused, and I was, I was, in, I was incensed. So I ran away and joined the, the circus. I was in show business. I loved it. And then I was initially, I initially came to Hollywood when I was like 15 or 16. Uh, I was taken out here, and uh, I won a contest, Rocket to Stardom, which I won, Rocket to Stardom. Then many years later, I was a star of Tomorrow, 72, 73, 74, and like my son says, tomorrow never came. One day, many years later, I was applying for food stamps, and my son called me on the phone, and he said, Dad, weren't you a star of tomorrow, 72, 73, and 74? And I just loved it, because it was sort of like the whole Hollywood story, you know? One day you're a star of tomorrow, the next you're doing food stamps, and I, at the time, was homeless in Hollywood. I just celebrated my 75th birthday. I am very proud of myself that I survived all the bullshit that they did to me. Very proud. And so every year for me, it's a proud year. One more year that I, that I made it. 
I was born in uh, Deming, New Mexico, uh, in 1932. My father brought me here to Los Angeles when I was nine years old, and I was raised in Los Angeles. I was very, like a, a tomboy, but I thought, well, there's other girls that I saw were like tomboys. But even at that, I, I, I was a little bit different because they could go home, put on a dress, and feel at home. But I, I, my mother would put a dress on me, and I just didn't like it. The first lesbian I met, she was a prostitute, and I didn't know. And I had bought my first car when I was 14 years old. I was already delivering Mexican bread. And she asked me for a ride. I told me, take me to see my girl. I thought it was her daughter. When we got over there, it was her girlfriend. Nice looking, you know. She was on bail for kidnap. She was hustling. She was a drug addict. So I felt very bad because I thought, is this what I'm about, you know? So by now I know. By now I know, you know, that I like women. I like girls. And I thought, this is what we are, you know? The dregs of society. And uh, I was not only bucking the family society, but the cops would pick me up and book me frequently for uh, masquerading, they called it. If you had a fly in the front or a shirt, you know, it was masquerade. There was, a, there was a, a city ordinance. And then they would tack something else on there if they felt like it. There's a lot of people that committed suicide when they found out they were gay, but I wouldn't give nobody that satisfaction. I'm gonna keep on going. And a lot of those people are gone and I'm still here. Well, L.A. today has changed. It changed a lot from when we were kids. It was not dangerous. You could go wherever you wanted to go. But here we got the actual gangs walking around, you know, and riding on your walls. People used to run through here. In fact, the helicopters were chasing a guy through here one day, and that's when I said, we can't have this. And one time, some guy had pulled in with a taxi with a... Uh, uh, somebody they were turning a trick right here and the police came up and all that and it's like man this is ridiculous you know living like that i grew up in los angeles actually in silver lake my whole family was born there both sides of the family my father's family is born about half a mile away from my mother's family and they met at church and they got married when they were very young and we've lived here all our lives it was fun growing up in this area because you had a lot of protection. I had, you know, a lot of relatives, a lot of cousins, and we played a lot, and school was fun. I really enjoyed school. It was really integrated, so we were not subject to a whole lot of discrimination and things. Even being gay, it wasn't that much. It was not considered a topic that would get you in trouble or something like that. It was just assumed that that's the way you were. I knew grown-ups that were that way and you just wait until you get big enough to express it, you know. This is a picture of me when I was in the United States Air Force in 1955. I joined so that I would have money to go to college. I was young, and uh, obviously I was cute. And I, by the way, as you know, I'm gay. And guys in the service that had service time would uh, approach me and, you know, I did things. You know, I thought it was really okay. I really never thought anything of it, but I was discharged unceremoniously, shall we say, and marched off the, the base with guns to my back as I was sent back to Los Angeles uh, as a homosexual, undesirable in the United States Army. I think that's why it was so traumatic. That's where I first found out about deep racism, and uh, you know, also homophobia. Basically, I'm working to get by from paycheck to paycheck, uh, which I've done for an awful long time. Sometimes I do feel like I'm in a catch-22 because I have to work in order to pay the rent and my other bills. It's this whole thing of retiring, if I retire either my crossing guard job or my ad sales business, I won't be able to afford the rent here. 
I'm almost 70 and I don't think I can do this much longer. I grew up in Amsterdam in Holland and lived there until I came to the United States when I was about 14 years old. It was very, very difficult at first because I didn't speak the language and I learned a little bit of English from Howdy Doody and shows like that. <laughs> I did pretty well. I was on the dean's list by January. In high school, I really wanted to become an artist, a graphic artist. So I studied advertising design, and I've done it basically all my life. It was an independent move for a girl or a woman at the time. My career kind of ended, I think, abruptly because I was doing the coming out process and because I got into some feminism. My relationship with my bosses no longer worked. I got to be a little bit more assertive and that didn't go over at all. And uh, after a while, I was asked to leave. I became an activist because A, it created some connection for me to a community and B, and I think more importantly, I got to see that if you do something about a problem, you get some results. When we marched on Washington, I really felt proud. There were big, big, big crowds. So you got to meet lesbians and gay men from all over the country and all over the world. And yeah, I felt really proud. I thought, wow, why haven't I done this before? I'm ready. I'm ready for the next issue. Uh, once I retire, I'm going to be looking for something. In LA and in California, we face what I would call a perfect storm of very high land values, but low median incomes in Los Angeles. When our company started 30 years ago, there was flight out into the suburbs. In the last five, seven, eight years, there's been enormous flight back into the city. And consequently, what you have is you have more people than you have housing units. Well, we're experiencing one of the worst housing crises in modern history. Um, there are people with lesser means who really have no resources and options. But affordable housing allows people, especially seniors, uh, to get through this crisis and have a place to live. Affordable housing across the board um, is almost non-existent um, in, for seniors who are making, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year in the city of Los Angeles. I've had so many seniors tell me that they never thought this would happen to them. They never thought that they would be in this financial situation. Wanting to be in a place where you can be open about your sexuality in a lower income environment is problematic. So for us to provide affordable housing in a spectacular location like we've been able to do, it, it's just an, it's sort of like a miracle for the seniors who will live there. The lottery process was designed for, for two things. As number one is to give everyone an equal opportunity in the application process so there was no preferential treatment and because we knew there would be a, a tremendous amount of applications coming into the process. Most developers opt for a lottery system where you have a certain amount of time to get it in, right? You, are, you go through a screening process to make sure that your application is actually eligible uh, and then they go through a blind lottery. Um, and select the first group from there, establish a waiting list, and then work their way down the list. Again, let's be another housing. Hi, could you tell me if the, if the lottery applications are available today? Uh, yes, sir, they are. This is it. I'm going to fill it out quickly. <laughs> Please list all sources of income in a month per month. AFDC, CalWORKs, nothing. Child support, nothing. Disability, nothing. Retirement, pension, nothing. I've tried to register to get on people's lists, and some of them are saying, call us back in five years and then you'll get on the list. And then it'll be at least five more years before you can get an apartment here. And that's 10 years from now, I can't wait that long. I would love to be in a gay and lesbian environment, but I also have this need thing of needing to retire. 
If I get into Triangle Square, it will be a dream come true. If I get a space in the new place, I'm looking forward to it because it's a new building. They have a swimming pool, which I have always wanted a swimming pool. And I brag about it, I tell people, you look what we're doing in California. I'm really happy about that. They'll always say, well, New York did this or New York did that. We were out here being gay long ago. I was a kid. We were just going to be gay, and that was it. And it feels like now we got a place to go and live in. Now that we're old, and we get to still be gay. Yay! <laughs> I've lived in so many places, and I've been discriminated in every place that I've ever lived. I never fit in completely. And I, it'd be so nice just to walk out and know they, they know what I'm about. I know what they're about. If I don't get picked, I'm going to be so disappointed. I'm so disappointed because I'm not really looking forward to a safe place where I can live safely. Oh, if I get a space in the building, I, I would think that all, all of the things that I have worked so hard for in life would be fulfilled, that it would be a real fulfilling way for me to go to the end of my life. I may be making a difference by stepping up and being part of a community that says, look, here we are. We're right there. And I want to be part of that. Do you have a live-in health care provider? No. Wouldn't be bad to have a boyfriend. I live in a low-income housing right now, but they're all young. And it's lonely. And everybody just lives with their doors closed. Nobody talks to each other. Nobody says, would you like to have coffee? And I need a balcony. That's why I'm going. I need a balcony for my baby, for my little kitty cat. I'm on my way to my new place and meet my new family. Now we just wait. Wait for the good news. That's how I think. Hopefully, they'll kick me. But I say, not my will, but thine be done. You know, I'm feeling really excited and trying not to uh, want it to happen so badly that when the lottery is picked and I'm not chosen, that I'm going to be so disappointed and upset because I don't have a good living situation where I'm at now. So with putting the envelope in the mail, I feel that the pre-application is a step for it happening to me. I feel great. Now all I have to do is cross my fingers, cross my legs, and cross my eyes. <laughs> yes, sir. I would like to. It's a great relief of doing the application, but now what I have to do, what I find I have to do, is I now have to let it go. I have to now, by my own personal beliefs, I have to let God take over. <sighs> Thank God. So, you know, one day at a time, you just <sighs> find something else to do for four weeks. Oh, it's to the front. Wow, this is nice. Wow, now, this is it. This is great, this is it's gonna be nice. A lot of cupboard space, good drawer space, huh? and a garbage disposal. I, don't, I, I like those, I don't have one now. Oh, this one has a balcony. This one's the one I want. <laughs> it's got a balcony. Oh my God. This is for my kitty cat. This is why I want to live here too. One here, here. <laughs> one of you in the window. <laughs> and this, you could put a sofa in here in the shower. 
My God. Lighting. See, you have lighting. You put your makeup on in here. Perfect. <laughs> I got a feeling that some gay people designed this thing. I really think so. This is the one that I'm going to pray for. This one right here. I hope they have more like this. And I hope I get picked on the lottery, too. Well, if I live here, this is going to be the best, you know, the very best. I want it so bad. I'm happy sad, because I don't know if I'm going to get it. I want to live here someday. I got this in the mail from the Triangle Square apartment. Dear Donald Norman, the process to be screened for one of the available apartments is as follows. Then it gives you what it is, a workshop hosted by Triangle Square on completing the application process. Gives you a couple of days, or oh, it's gonna be on Thursday, February the 8th, first session, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. That's the one I'm going to. This process does not guarantee an apartment. Uh-oh. I will be there on February the 8th at 9 a.m to do this. Hope I make it. Is it that's the blood test? Okay, because my counts went up and my T cells went down. So when do you when do you want me to come in? Bye bye. It's not a surprise. T cells going down, viral loads going up. I want that's, that that doesn't bother me as much as I want to I wanna live <laughs> in Hollywood. Then I'll be happy. <laughs> busy. <laughs> it's busy a lot. I think there's one lady there that's taking care of everybody. Is this Triangle Square Management? Okay, yeah, my name is Artie Geary, and I'm trying to find out if, I've, uh, if, uh, if I am on the 150 application thing. Okay, thank you. She's gonna check. Hello? <sighs> I think they're gone. Hello? Who's gonna call me? Uh, that would be Sarah. Sarah? Yes. Sarah's handling it. Sarah's not there. Sarah will call me back. It's tough. You have to want it real bad <laughs> to hang on to this. Is this Sarah? Hi, this is Art Aguirre. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm okay, thank you. How can we help you today? I was I'm interested in finding out if uh, if you if if you could find out for me if I'm on the 150 t uh, list. Okay, on that list, I've just checked your name. Yes. The 150, you are not on that list, but you are still on the waiting list. Okay. okay. So basically, what that means is that you are. Still I just found out that I'm not on the first 150. It's a little bit depressing. It's a lot depressing, but uh, I, like I said before, I'm not going to give up or understand that maybe I'm not supposed to live there. Maybe I'm supposed to go somewhere else. I don't know, but I'm not going to give up on this because I want to live there. It's a long time, isn't it? I got fed back into a voicemail with the message, this mailbox is currently full. That wasn't nice. Huh. Hi, Sarah, and this is Margot Strick. I was on hold for quite some time, and then I got hung up on. <laughs> I'm starting to hear that people are receiving their uh, packets uh, the application packet, and I haven't received anything except a postcard that says we'll be, you'll be hearing from us. And I'm wondering, is that it? Is that the end of the process, or am I still on a list? And might I still get a packet?
we're looking to see if I'm on a good list at this point. If I didn't have the arthritis, I would keep my fingers crossed, but it's kind of difficult. <laughs> Come on. I am on a waiting list. Does that mean I'm in that group of 138? So let's just hope you've got a lot of criminals lined up in that 150. <laughs> America's most wanted, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Bye-bye. Shit. Yeah, that doesn't look good. I don't know. I had visions of quitting my job and not having to work anymore. And, and Well, since I don't have a final answer, there's always a little ray of hope here. But it's not looking too good. But I think I'm just going to go to work and <laughs> forget about it. This is Bill LaValley, William LaValley, and I had sent in an initial um, application for the uh, housing, and uh, I hadn't gotten a packet yet. Some people have said they've got, no, no, I didn't get a packet. I'm on what list? Uh, oh. <laughs> Does uh, that mean I, I'm getting a packet? Uh, okay, um, well, what should I do? Because um, my mail came and there was nothing in the mail. And that's almost my address. So you have maybe a wrong address on me. Okay, I'm t to go to, okay. Well, thank you very, very much, Sarah. Thanks a lot. Bye. <sighs> I got back it. <laughs> I didn't realize how much it meant to me. <laughs> or how disappointed I'd have been if I hadn't gotten one. <laughs> Everything else has been going so badly lately that uh, this coming through is a real, a real miracle. Um, so what I have to do is I gotta I gotta go get the packet. You know what a guy needs right now? A little Judy Garland. When you're smiling. <laughs> when Here we go, Judy. I got it. If I could click my feet I would, but I can't click my heels. I think I'm gonna go too fast down this thing here. Uh, I built this little model of Triangle Square apartments before um, the lottery and did a little ritual about, <clears throat> you know, being able to have an apartment there. So this says Triangle Square, then it shows some elderly men in one of the apartments. And there I am, and it says Gay Lesbian Elder Housing. So I did a little ritual and prayer, asking the light to uh, let me get uh, on the 150 lottery. And um, it didn't happen. Didn't happen. So I still have the model, though. I still, it's like, it's still, it's still out there. It's still important to me. I just spoke to my youngest son, Greg, and he said he was worried. Um, they, that they were doing all they could, but he was concerned. And you know, and then I tried, oh, well, I'm doing this and that, and don't worry about me, and uh, it's not true, I am worried. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any place to go. The, the lottery process um, is a very cold process. <laughs> A name, names go in and they pull names out. They have no idea what the circumstances are. 
you know, from that application. But there are people applying to get into that building who are on the verge of being homeless. Um, there are people applying to get into that building who, uh, who, are, who are sick with AIDS and uh, disabled and are also on the verge of being homeless. Um, so there are some very definite needs in our community that just isn't being addressed anyplace else. And so it's not just, I think I want to live there. It's, I have to get in. I have to have a home. I have to have a place to go to. And that's not going to happen for a lot of them. Three and a half hours to showtime. Tonight we're here to finally go to the formal opening of Triangle Square and uh, I'm here as a guest and because I'm a guest they asked me to speak. <laughs> the lobby is beautiful, it's just beautiful. Never expected it to look this way when we came in the first time that time when it was under construction. Never expected. It's very hard to be standing here not knowing if they're going to give me an apartment. Look what they built for us, you know, for us, all people, you know, a place to, to, to feel safe again. And all the people here made it happen, or making it happen, and I like that. They don't know that I'm who I am, that I'm, I'm the reason for them doing all this stuff. Oh, this should have a balcony? They're all over here. How old do you want to be? <laughs> How old do you have to be? 62. So you're almost 60. No, not really. Oh, wow. Man. I, I see people with like wonder on their face. Is this really happening? And it is. <laughs> and I think. One of my favorite parts is this two-bedroom apartment. I mean, that's what it's all about. You know, every, everything else is icing on the cake of some place for people to live. And so I think my favorite part is this, is, is this apartment. And this is a great evening. I think you'll all agree that we are uh, standing in a historic place at a historic time, and I want to thank you, each and every one of you for coming. One of the most gratifying things that has happened as we've gone through this process is that we've actually met the people, we've seen the faces, we've heard the stories, and we know from their experiences what the needs are. I'd like to introduce a couple of those people to you tonight. The first one will be Margot Strick. Thank you. Welcome to my home. I've never had so many people over before. <laughs> and you're all so nicely dressed, too. I really like about this being my home. Not yet, anyway. I'm one of hundreds of applicants who are anxiously awaiting the results of the process. I'm on waiting list for several HUD senior buildings from Pasadena to LA. I'm on the waiting list for a Section 8 voucher, but nothing has happened for two years except the wait. I look at these options as my safety net, just in case Triangle Square doesn't work out for me. My dream is to live totally out and where I can enjoy the company and camaraderie of other gay and lesbian seniors. 
not in some HUD-funded closet in Pasadena. Tonight, as a community, we're realizing our dream. My own dream is still alive, too, and I and the other Triangle Square hopefuls in this gathering ask that you send us lots of good energy. Thank you. Not knowing if Triangle Square was really going to be a reality, I had to keep moving. What about tightening this one right here? Well, we're on the road and all packed up, Jim and Greg, the guys are behind us, and we're on our way out to El Monte and to the Capri Gardens. Next step is buying the mobile home and then move in and have the whole crew help and be in in, in an hour. Uh, tonight is the first night that I'll be spending in my new home. I'm excited. There's, there's a, a, lot, a lot to be done to this little place to make it, you know, feel like mine and feel like home. Here we are, look at Capri Gardens. And I want, I want you to notice all of the uh, wonderful little knickknacks. Oh, look at here. Isn't that cool? There is a butterfly. The original, original screen and wood. So important. Flamingo. Yes, flamingo. Oh, wow. Oh, Greg, what's this? They're still working on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> nope, that's in the contract. Okay. Oh my gosh, okay. this is great. Isn't, this, isn't it I hilarious? I know. Mom, this is going to be so cool. Isn't it cute? Oh, it's gonna, yeah. We're going to be able to make this really, really cool. Yeah, it is. Wow. So I think that this door is in good shape, but you need a new, new screens in here. Right. It's, you know, it's not like uh, moving into a brand new apartment. And, and it feels smaller than what it was, what I saw the first time. It's very 50s. Mm -hmm. Busted. It's just spinning around. Okay. I know that that was one of the inspectors. Things. It's really, it's quite, quite warm in there. Quite, quite warm. What I uh, said to Jim and Greg today when they were packing me up, I said, you know, when it comes time that I've died, you can just hook that trailer up to this hitch and take me out on the Catalina Ferry and just drop the whole thing off there. <laughs> they said, sounds like a plan, Mom. <laughs> Here. <laughs> All right. Ready? Ready? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you've been waiting for this. Me too. Here goes. I like surprises. Wow. Wow. 
Congratulations. Wow, this is amazing. I'm moving. <laughs> okay. Got it. We got it. <laughs> yeah. I have been waiting for this. Oh, thank you so much. I just adore you. Thank you so much. Once again, congratulations. I did it. Oh, my hope he's going to be so happy to see all those people from her balcony. <laughs> Dear Mr. Norman, we regret to inform you that your application for occupancy of the, at the Triangle Square Apartments for the Low Income Housing Tax Credit have, has been declined. According to the information you provided, your current total household monthly income exceeds the maximum amount allowable. I opened the letter and I read it and I felt sad. I thought, oh, after all of that, that I went through and I have submitted everything that I don't qualify. The minute that I found out that I did not qualify anything, I started thinking. And I started thinking, what can I do? And I have been repairing this house. I have been doing everything. I've repainted the floors. I've redecorated. I'm getting new things. And so I'm doing it. And I'm pretty happy. You know, I would be really happy up there. You know, I'd be tickled to be there. And I'm happy here. I think I'd be happy wherever I am. I'll make it. I'll make it. easy to open. Oh, this is great. Oh, this is great. Unless it's up here, no? No, it's nice. It's really nice. <laughs> it was worth the wait. <laughs> I like to cut hair, I would cut it right here. <laughs> I'll be the resident right barber. You're gonna have to shoot me out of here. I'm not leaving. This is it. I can't take another move. I'm 75 after all, you know. Come a long way. Oh, yeah. I never thought that that day would come. I've been to hell and back. <laughs> and I'm here now. It'll be all right. This has been such a long but wonderful wait, hasn't it been? I'm 23. And 522. Here it is. Oh. Oh my goodness. Oh, this is wonderful. Oh, this is wonderful. Then look at the bedroom, two windows. I'm just thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled to death. And uh, I think I'll be able to get bookshelves, a couple of bookshelves in here. Um, so it's gonna, it's just, it's wonderful. I just, I just can't wait to, to move in and get started. And here we are, the keys to 522, the beginning of a brand new, wonderful life. Big closet. I'm going to go here, right? This is about a double bed. Mm -hmm. 
It's Hollywood. <laughs> And my kitty cat. I had to trust in my thinking and my and my belief system that this would happen. And some days it wasn't easy. Some days I, I I almost gave up. It will happen. Trust it. Even on the days when you don't, trust it. I live here. I live here, you know. I got a letter from them saying that I was on the waiting list. You know what, I, I don't even understand it to this day, the lottery. I, don't, I have no clue as to what they did. I know about going in a store and buying a scratch off. You know, that's what they should have done, just had big scratch offs you know, <laughs> with our names. Oh, a winner, no, a loser. <laughs> First, the trailer didn't feel like a step up, it felt like a stepped down and I hadn't come to terms with myself. I mean, you have to realize that I, I have moved 62 times or more and then came to a place that I once again, once again had to make home, once again had to unpack, once again had to create. And um, it, I, I just, I was devastated. If I were offered a space, uh, triangle Square, I, I would pack up and get ready to move and move as soon as I had a date to there. I would love it, yeah. You know, my hope with the Triangle Square is that it will be uh, a paradigm for what can be done uh, on a national level you know, for a healing that can happen uh, across our country and across our world, you know, it's just, it's just the beginning. There's so much discrimination in this world, and finally there's a place for these seniors to go and feel at home and not have to lie and hide like they've been forced to do for so much of their lives. It will, it will also say to that world out there, we take care of our own. We know how to do that, and we care about our elderly. It, it's just in the, it's sort of like a miracle for the seniors who will live there. They'll have a beautiful building in a wonderful location, surrounded by people that they are simpatico with, and uh, at a price that they can actually afford. We've clearly demonstrated the need um, for affordable housing for our seniors. Um, and so now we're able to take the name Triangle Square and kind of travel across the country with it, build all the ones in Los Angeles and, and eventually across the country. People build buildings all the time. And it's, it's, it's to create that that's energy and to create that whole um, sense of belonging is something that you have to have in your heart that you want to create. Triangle Square uh, really is, from my point of view, um, a promise kept. To look at the people and know that we've done a good job. And uh, we've, we've helped somehow in a, in a small way because it needs so much more. But to know that we've helped it's really important.
Shit.